This is the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. And now, Rebecca Larson. Welcome to the show. On today's episode, I'm discussing a topic I feel I know very little about, William Shakespeare. But thankfully, I'll have a little help from an expert on the subject, and we'll have her answer some of your questions at the end as well. William Shakespeare is arguably the most well-known playwright of all time. To learn more about him today, I have special guest Cassidy Cash from That Shakespeare Life podcast on to educate me, and maybe you too, on the life of William Shakespeare. But before we get started, here's a little bit about Cassidy. Cassidy Cash is an award-winning filmmaker, artist, and host of the podcast, That Shakespeare Life. Cassidy believes that in order to take Shakespeare's work from page to performance, understanding the history of the man who wrote them is essential. Her work focuses on exploring the real life and history of William Shakespeare and using art to help her fellow Shakespeareans learn something new about the bard. With that, I'd like to welcome Cassidy Cash to the show. Welcome, Cassidy. Hi, Rebecca. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to have you on the show and excited to talk about William Shakespeare. So with that, I want to start from the beginning with you today, because those of us who are passionate about a subject usually have a great story to tell about how we got started or what drew us to a subject. So what got you interested in Shakespeare? I love this question. Um, I was originally drawn into Shakespeare by his works. I was a young reader, and even today I struggle visually with letters, seeing them, something about my eyes. Letters give me trouble. So reading long books is hard for me, and I just thought that that's the way books were until I was visiting my great-grandmother at her home in rural Alabama. I had gone out there with my grandparents, and in her house, my great-grandmother only had three books, like total. She had three. It was a Bible, a hymnal, and a copy of Romeo and Juliet. And I picked it up initially from curiosity, but I remember being surprised when I opened the cover at how the pages looked when I opened it. This wasn't an ordinary book. And my grandmother was happy for me to read it because it gave me something to do on those long visits to the country. And as I dove into them, just visually, the short lines of Shakespeare's plays were easier for me to read. And because they were rhythmic and they rhymed, I could follow it better visually. And so once I started reading them, and they were so funny because Shakespeare's incredibly witty and sarcastic, and I was just hooked. And once I fell in love with his writing, I wanted to know, you know, who had written these wonderful things that were, you know, so different for me and and easier for me to read. And he just, Shakespeare just quickly became a hero of mine, probably because I was grateful to him for writing something that was easier for my eyes. (laughs) And as I learned more about him, I found out he came from Stratford and that he had, you know, showed up in London to say, I'm going to be the best, and then went on and, and changed the world with his creativity. And as an artist and an entrepreneur and as a person, the more I learn about William Shakespeare, I'm just inspired by him. So I think I, I respect him a great deal. And I never get tired of going back to his plays and hearing Henry V yell once more into the breach, dear friends, once more, you know, it, it just never, never gets old. And I think because what Shakespeare has accomplished is so extraordinary. After I fell in love with his artwork, I wanted to know more about the person. And that's what led me to study his life. I wanted to know what kind of man it was that made such beautiful and lasting things. Wow. that's a, I, I love those stories. Like what got you started? Everybody has an amazing, this is what got me started story. And that is also an amazing one, Cassidy. As I said, when I opened the show, um, you have a podcast and I'm not sure if you're like me, but the reason that I started my podcast is because I had several requests to do one and I thought, well, what the hell, why not? What is your, (laughs) what's your podcast origin story? I was so intrigued by this question. I did not have legions of people asking me to start one. Um, the, I am a classically trained artist with an English degree and I'm very good at communicating complex ideas through art and words. I was using this skill to help entrepreneurs design their lead magnets. I, I have a background in digital design and logos and ebooks and social media marketing. And I love this job and the people I worked with. So I set out to get a master's degree in information engineering. And that was basically, I was trying to be better at marketing because I thought that's what I was going to do. And while I was going through these classes, the running question from our very entrepreneurially minded faculty was, what are you passionate about? And it was 
suggested to me that it was more than a dream to think that I could do anything I wanted to do if I was willing to do a lot of hard work to get it. And so since I was going to have to work hard at it anyway, I decided to answer the question, what was I passionate about? And I thought, you know, someone else posed the question, if you could do anything you wanted to do and money, you know, wasn't the issue, what would you do with your days, with your time, if you could pick? And I thought, I would sit down over a cup of coffee and talk with the historical experts I admire about William Shakespeare. And I wanted to learn from them about the life of my hero. I just sure, wasn't sure how I was going to do that. But I became convinced through the master's degree process, if you can believe that, because it doesn't seem it would go together, but it did. I, I became convinced that when I looked at my future and what my kids were going to tell their grandkids about my life one day, I didn't want them to say, mom was in digital marketing. I wanted them to say, my mom loved Shakespeare. And so I knew I had to change course. And despite my English degree, and a few people would say because of it, I communicated much better um, in, on video or through voice than I did uh, in text, like trying to write a blog. And so first I chose to do video histories because I could be you know, completely in control of that. It was just me and my research. And I would ask questions I wanted to learn about, research the answers, and then share what I discovered on video. With the incredible support of my truly wonderful husband, I launched my YouTube channel on the history of William Shakespeare, sitting on the bed at my aunt's house in Sao Paulo, Brazil. We were on vacation at the time, and I tell everyone now that I have it on good authority that all major life choices should be made from the shores of the South Atlantic Sea. But that's where I was, right there on vacation. I decided I was going to be a Shakespearean. I committed immediately to the YouTube channel, and I've been producing weekly videos asking, did Shakespeare ever since, and that was almost two years ago. But after a year of the YouTube channel, I was studying Shakespeare, and I was having a blast doing the research, but I still wasn't doing that interview over coffee with fellow Shakespeareans. And it was about that time that someone said to me, have you ever thought about a podcast? And I said, well, I don't know what that is. What's a podcast? <laughs> I didn't know how to get started, but I went looking and I found some other people that were doing history podcasts. I found out about the interview format and I went, oh, this is perfect. And so I, I didn't have any idea how to move that way. So I went and found what is the best podcasting coach ever and a stellar mastermind group, which I'm still a part of today. And they took me over about six months, helped me come up with, with a plan and a strategy. We scheduled some interviews and then I launched the ver first ever episode of That Shakespeare Life on Shakespeare's birthday, April 23rd, 2018. We just recently celebrated our very first birthday. So It's crazy to me that you've only been doing this for a year because it seems like you've been doing it so much longer. You have such a great show. Uh, that is just a massive compliment. Thank you so much. <laughs> Now, as I stated before, you are the expert in my eyes on Shakespeare. So for those who may not know much about him, could you give us kind of a brief background on his life? Well, um, I think I can. I, it's kind of hard to condense all of Shakespeare down into a few <laughs> sentences. I mean, he was he was born. He lived like a shriek of lightning across history. And then he died with a curse <laughs> on his bones. You know, that's that's the short version. <laughs> but um, I think if you're asking me kind of what do I think it's most, what's the most important thing I would want you to know about William Shakespeare, I think it would be that I'd like you to see him as an example of anyone can accomplish great things if they're creative and don't give up. I think one of the coolest stories I love about William Shakespeare that encapsulates for me how I think of him as a person is when he started the Globe with the Burbages, the man who owned the land where the theater was located was trying to run them off. And so they owned the building, but he owned the land. And he said, well, I'm not going to renew your lease. And so the idea was he thought if he didn't renew the lease on the land that they would have to leave. Well, Shakespeare and his friends didn't take it like that. In the dead of night, in the dead of winter, right, they went out there and took this whole thing down, timber by timber, and moved it across what was then a frozen Thames River and set it up, and this was my favorite part, right outside the limits of the London authorities. So it was just outside where he could, you know, be prosecuted, but still close enough that the London residents were available for ticket sales. And I know he's English, but it's just such an American cowboy thing to do that it makes me very happy. <laughs> He's a, Shakespeare was a cowboy. I know. You can make that case, yeah. I love it. <laughs> without, without the actual cow. <laughs> now, with your podcast, you pretty much put out one episode a week, right? 
I do, yes, every Monday. Okay, so what kind of subjects do you cover on your show, and who are some of the guests that you've had on? Well, That Shakespeare Life takes listeners behind the curtain and into the real life and history of William Shakespeare. We start with an interesting question about what life was like for the bard, and then we interview an expert that's done extensive research into that usually very narrow question and explore the answer. It's fun because no matter the question, even if you think the answer is very, very simple, it's almost never simple. We'll get into the conversation and it's always, wow, or you're kidding, or did they really do that? We talk about, you know, Shakespeare's poofy shorts and what the tutors thought about breakfast and what they ate and the quill pen and would he have used a pencil instead. And we look at the history of things like the founding of Jamestown that would become the United States happened during Shakespeare's lifetime. Of course, we look at things like the Essex Rebellion and all of these things are usually mentioned or referred to in the plays. So the idea is to enhance the experience of seeing and experiencing Shakespeare's plays by giving you an inside track and introducing you to the history that fueled what he was writing. And each episode is also tied back to the plays because I believe that understanding the history of William Shakespeare is essential to understanding the plays. There are key phrases, words, and contexts that really come alive when you understand who Shakespeare was and the time period he was living in. Some of the Specific guests we've had the pleasure of speaking with include many of my heroes and people I would definitely recommend you get to know if you enjoy Shakespeare. People like Dan Falk, Paul Edmondson, Glenn Perry, Jonathan Bates, and there's there's a lot of guests that I could mention their names and it's they're wonderful to hear from. But it's a great group of Shakespeare minds that that I've, I'm honored to have had on as excellent guests. Now, when I originally asked you to be on the show, um, I you know self-professed, know very little about William Shakespeare. So I quickly went online and did a little bit of research. And the first thing that caught my eye, and I want you to correct me if I'm wrong on this, because I'm sure others have read the same thing, that I read that Shakespeare died on his birthday. And if that's true, then he has something in common with Elizabeth of York. So do we, first of all, is that true? Do we even know when he was born? That's a very fun question. Um, Technically, Shakespeare did die on his birthday, but that's because we've assigned his birthday to him. Um, We don't actually have a record like a birth certificate or a birth record for William Shakespeare. The reason his birth date is estimated to be April 23rd, 1564 is because the record we do have of him is that he was baptized on April 26th, 1564. And we use historical context to trace it back and say, okay, well, that means he must have been born on the 23rd. Typically, babies were baptized about three days after their birth, and so that's why they they place it there. But there's a lot of other issues that go into it, like there's questions about holy days and customs surrounding baptism and Sundays specifically having an impact on when parents chose to baptize their kids. And of course, all of that is subject to wondering how many of these traditional customs did John and Mary Shakespeare actually follow that year with William. And so... There's a lot of questions about assigning that, but it was basically a collective agreement. We, we've decided that Shakespeare needs a birthday, and this is when. So <laughs> I love it. Uh, you know, it's funny because that was the first thing I noticed, of course, when you Google, you know, William Shakespeare. The first thing that pulls up is Wikipedia, and it says right on there that his – um, his baptismal d- date or, you know, was on this date. And so that's what kind of got me thinking about it a little bit more going, well, how do we know? So I'm glad you answered that question because I'm, I'm fairly certain there are others out there who have probably been wondering the same thing as well. Yes, it's a very, very clever observation and absolutely correct. We say that he was born and died on the same day, but yes, that's, that's a guess. Perfect. Well, like I said, when I contacted you originally, it was because I had just watched the 2011 film called Anonymous. So for those of you who aren't familiar with it, the film covers the theory that it was, in fact, Edward de Vere, Earl of Oxford, who was the man behind the well-known works of Shakespeare. It's set against the backdrop of the succession of Queen Elizabeth I and the Essex Rebellion against her. Now, being the Shakespeare expert that you are, I'd love it if you'd address this theory. Was Edward Vere the genius behind the pen? Well, I want you to know that I watched this film because I consider you a friend. <laughs> I, <love laughs> and I, I was not going to watch this movie. I was avoiding it on purpose. But I, I watched it um, at your request. And so 
I made it through exactly one hour of this film, and I have I have a lot of thoughts. I love it. I, I'm okay. impressed. I'm impressed that you made it through an hour. I really thought it was going to be like ten minutes. <laughs> oh well, you know what's amazing is I didn't actually turn it off because of how they were representing Shakespeare. I got annoyed with their representation of Elizabeth the First. I felt like the film portrayed her as very weak and emotional. She was motivated by her affairs and love interests, incredibly easy to influence at the hands of her wiser and more competent advisors. They really painted her as this puppet to the court, and I felt like that was absolutely absurd. Everything I've read and learned about Elizabeth I is that she is right up there with Napoleon and George Washington as one of the finest military leaders the world has ever seen. She was strong and focused and absolutely nothing if not completely focused on England first above herself. And I think if she wasn't focused on England above herself, she'd have married Robert Dudley in 1575. So I was really just turned off by their treatment of her than I was about Shakespeare. I went into the film knowing of course, I mean, my show is called That Shakespeare Life, so I knew I was going to disagree with their premise, but as an artist, I was I was tolerant of it. I thought, well, it can still be a good film, you know, even if I don't like it. Like, you know, I'm not hanging everybody's painting up in my house. It doesn't have to be my cup of tea. Maybe it'll still be good. But I ended up being disappointed on on several counts. The, the three plays that in the movie, Johnson, DeVere gives Johnson three plays for Shakespeare, and they are Julius Caesar, Macbeth, and Romeo and Juliet. Now, this movie is taking place around 1599 because the movie operates on the premise that Elizabeth is sending Essex to Ireland. And we know Romeo and Juliet was definitely performed by 1597. So it would not have been one of the ones that De Vere could have given over to be performed at that time. And Macbeth... Whether or not you want to claim it was written by Shakespeare, the play itself was definitely written for King James in a response to the gunpowder plot of 1605. And since Edward de Vere died in 1604, it, that's complicated at best to explain how he would have pulled that off. Um, now, Julius Caesar gets a pass because it was written in 1599. So I thought, okay, uh, we'll let them have that one. Now, <laughs> I was like, all right, fine. I won't argue that one. But... Shakespeare was famous and well received in London by 1599. So even if he was, you know, a puppet the way the play portrays he was, he was he had a good reputation by 1599 and you can the the film suggests he was fabricated as an identity around the time that Essex was going to Ireland and history tells us that couldn't be accurate because the entire reason Essex was able to use Shakespeare's company as an attack on the queen with his performance of Richard II in 1601 was because William Shakespeare was the biggest playwright in town. He was making a massive statement. And so Shakespeare wouldn't have had time to, to build up or have it be built up for him the kind of reputation Essex needed to play that card if things went down the way they show in the film. Now, I did like one thing they did that did not happen in the movie Shakespeare in Love was that Elizabeth would not have seen the plays at the Globe. And this... This movie showed that very well. They showed that, you know, the queen would not have been exposed to these plays in the playhouse. They would have come to her. I thought they did that well. But I sort of felt like overall the film was pretty meticulous on some of their historical details and then totally ignored others when it wasn't serving their purpose. And um, I just wasn't, I wasn't a fan. I, was, I can't. I can't do this. You know, Elizabeth was not some bumbling idiot to be carried away by a play that appealed to her emotions. She doesn't strike me as someone that was easily deceived. And I don't think the entire ruse would have gone over the way the film shows. I was actually open to the film changing my mind, but I didn't see any evidence there that would cause me to change my position. And at the outset, I will say anonymous claims that there are no books connected to William Shakespeare. And I, I want to research that claim further, but I will say that according to researchers at King's College London in the early 1600s, which is when the play, the movie was set, William Shakespeare was the most published writer in England with numerous books for sale at St. Paul's bookstalls. So I'm not sure how the film justifies some of the claims. Um, it doesn't seem to mesh well with the historical records I'm aware of. 
But scientifically, let's say I'm open to the discovery of evidence one day that might change my mind. But right now, I haven't seen anything I consider credible. So since you only made it an hour in, I don't believe you saw the part um, where somebody hides the manuscripts in a trunk. And that, I believe that happens at the beginning. Oh, it they does. Okay. Of, they preview it, and then I'm assuming they did it like the film was going to go back to that. It's like they showed it at first, and then they flashed back, and I never saw the part where they come back to him hiding them in a trunk. Okay, so this is this addresses my next thing was I you know I told you I watched Anonymous that inspired me you know to talk about this with you but I'm also obsessed with the American TV program called Curse of Oak Island on the History yes. Channel. Yes. <laughs> now I want to for those of you who haven't seen it I'm going to kind of read a brief description um, of the show from IMDb so that you get a little idea um, of what it's what it's about. So Oak Island is a tree-covered island on the south shore of Nova Scotia that intrigued treasure hunters for more than 200 years. It's believed that the island is hiding one of the greatest treasures of all time, but no one has been able to find it. So enter in Rick and Marty Lagina, brothers from Michigan, who have bought rights to much of the island to try and solve this mystery. The two use modern technology and good old American know-how to look for the treasure. But it's not an easy search. It's expensive and dangerous. And several people have died trying to strike it rich on Oak Island, inspiring, <clears throat> excuse me, inspiring the curse. The Laginas hope to avoid the curse long enough to find the treasure before they run out of money or worse. So interesting concept, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. But, but the question is, how does this relate to Shakespeare? Well, it's believed that Shakespeare's lost manuscripts are part of that treasure. And interestingly enough, they have found pieces of leather book binding buried deep underground. So is it possible that Shakespeare's lost manuscripts are in Nova Scotia? I'm a big fan of that American know-how. You know, this this show in particular is dangerous because it's like a, it's like a potato chip. You you can't eat just one. But I don't know. I don't know about Nova Scotia. But I wouldn't be surprised at all if there are some missing manuscripts yet to be discovered. We know that plays like Cardenio were written, but we don't currently have printed copies. So I always hold out hope that we'll find some of the lost plays one day. I'm convinced there is a lot of Shakespeare history that people have become comfortable with the word missing. And what may actually be true is that we just haven't gone and discovered them yet. And as an example, um, one of our guests on that Shakespeare life in episode 24, Glenn Perry stops by to visit with us because he recently made a discovery about Shakespeare's history in exactly this way. There were, for years, historians have ruminated on the idea of what exactly happened to John Shakespeare. We assumed that there was some kind of financial trouble that caused William Shakespeare to have to leave grammar school before graduation, but there wasn't really any evidence to confirm or deny what actually happened until Glenn uncovered these new documents. And when we were speaking with him, we're like, how did you un uncover these? And he didn't go out to some mysterious Oak Island and dig it up out of an archaeological site. These were literally documents that had been safely stored in a box in a salt mine where England keeps many of its national historical records. And it was discovered quite simply because he and his team were willing to do the boring work of sifting through a box in an archive that other people were willing to let sit there and, and just say, oh, we don't know collectively. And so I think absolutely there is a lot of information which we believe is missing from our understanding of Shakespeare's life that's probably not actually gone from you know, posterity, it's just buried inside an archive box somewhere in the back of a library or down in a salt mine. And there's a shortage of individuals willing to spend time digging through random attic boxes. So hopefully one day someone will discover these. I hope so. Yes. And who knows? It may be on the next Oak Island episode, you know. <laughs> I doubt it, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they're ever going to find it anyway. <laughs> well, you know. They keep me enter entertained nonetheless. They're good at that, yes. <laughs> Definitely. Well, lastly, Cassidy, I want to ask you some of the listener-submitted questions, if you don't mind. Oh, that's exciting. I'll be glad to see what I can do. All right. So the first one is, was Queen Elizabeth a patron of the arts and a fan of Shakespeare, as depicted in the movie Shakespeare in Love? Oh, I think Elizabeth was definitely a fan of Shakespeare's. She ordered him to perform at court quite regularly, and she didn't shut him down or imprison him on numerous occasions that she would have had just cause. And 
she, she was personally a huge fan of the arts. She participated them in them independently. And I think it was strategic on Shakespeare's part to know of her interest and capitalize on it. You can see in his works that he's often very intentional to pay attention to what she enjoyed and translate that into plays that he wanted her to be supportive of. His history plays are very favorable of England and he was really shrewd in that way. And he stays that way. Even under James I, you see Shakespeare using plays to flatter and impress the sitting monarch. He, he wasn't a fool. He knew what Elizabeth wanted to see and he delivered. That said, she was not his patron officially. In 1583, after this huge bout of plague wiped out many of the existing playing companies, there was a large restructuring in the industry where Playing companies now found themselves short-staffed and many had to disband altogether. And Elizabeth took advantage of this situation by hand-picking the best players of her two rival companies that were patroned by men who were vying for her affection. And she took the best members of these companies and created her own company called the Queen's Men. Now, Shakespeare was not a member of this, but keep in mind, this is when Shakespeare was about 19 years old. He had just married Anne Hathaway and had Susanna, and he wouldn't show up himself in London until the early 1590s. So just before he gets there, throughout the 1580s, Elizabeth's Queen Men, Queen's Men were the dominant playing company. But by the 1590s, when Shakespeare shows up in force, his company, the Lord Chamberlain's Men, goes on to nominate the next decade. And when, and Queen Elizabeth's Men was the first large company of actors in English Renaissance theater. Before then, companies were really small, which is what made it easy for plague to wipe them out. Because of this larger size that Elizabeth put together, they were able to do history plays like her company did a production of Henry V where they could put you know, big battle scenes on stage. And when Shakespeare makes his splash in London, I don't think it's an accident that he does so by staging similar history plays, encouraged in that direction by knowing it's what Elizabeth wanted. And when plague hits London again in the early 1590s, it basically decimates the Queen's Men Company. And once everything's reorganized after plague again in 1594, the Queen's Men died out. And Elizabeth, notably, did not patronize Shakespeare's company officially, but she also did not recreate a new company for herself, seemingly content to let Shakespeare take the reins there. And I think that speaks volumes about what she must have thought about the bard. Interesting. Well, now that we've mentioned Shakespeare love and I mentioned Anonymous, are there any other Shakespeare themed films that maybe we should know about? Oh, you should absolutely go see every play adaptation Kenneth Branagh has ever made um, and any future ones for that matter. But after that, I really enjoy Shakespeare documented. I've not finished all of that yet, but there's also a documentary on Netflix right now with John Nettles. If you're a fan of Midsummer Murders, you'll enjoy seeing him in that called Shakespeare the Legacy. There's also a show, if you like history on this time period, it's called Tudor Treasures with Lucy Worsley. And learning about the Tudors will really enhance what you understand about Shakespeare's plays when you see them performed. So that's a great one to check out as well. I didn't even know about that second one with Lucy. Now, now I'll have yeah. to go check that one out. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, she focuses on Hampton Court Palace. It's, it's fascinating. Oh, I, that's one of my places on my to-go-to list someday. I think it just looks marvelous. Yes, absolutely. So the next question we have is, do you think that Shakespeare helped the Elizabethan culture evolve in the later years of her reign, or did Elizabeth's reign help Shakespeare evolve into the master poet or playwright that he became? I think William Shakespeare bloomed where he was planted, and he deserves the credit for having done that at great personal sacrifice, but he had the advantage of being planted in extremely rich soil. The Elizabethan era was grand, and it focused on the arts because of Elizabeth and the Renaissance, and Shakespeare, with all of his talents and skills, was perfect in that environment. That the environment was, result, was the result of Elizabeth, the Renaissance, and this massive explosion of philosophical thought, science, exploration was going on during this time, and Shakespeare... I really feel like Shakespeare just thrived there. Now, the next question, you may have kind of like answered this one a little bit already, but what roles did Shakespeare's work play in politics? And did Shakespeare engage in political commentary in the form of sarcasm? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Um, the theater was born out of things like mummeries and morality plays of the church from centuries past, and Elizabethan theater had politics at its heart. You can see through the example of the Essex Rebellion we mentioned earlier with Richard II, 
patrons would routinely use the theater as a way to express their political opinions, to try and sway popular thought, to even gauge popular opinion, and to make statements about the political goings on of the day. I think Shakespeare's plays absolutely play with sarcasm, definitely. But his particular genius is he always seems to leave you with a question. He could be insulting you directly, but was he really? One of the things Shakespeare was really masterful at is asking questions and leaving them just the right amount of unanswered. And I think that contributed to his ability to avoid prosecution on many of his more political points. Yeah, exactly. It was a dangerous game he was playing there. Absolutely. The next question we have is, was A Midsummer's Night's Dream a stab at Robert Dudley, and was the Fairy Queen based on Queen Elizabeth I? Well, the British Library has a great sort of write-up on some of this. They have this rare pamphlet that was a festival book produced to commemorate Elizabeth I's visit to Elvetham. I think I'm saying that right. I learned I don't pronounce English cities correctly as an American, but Elvetham in September of 1591. Now, this is when Shakespeare would have been about 27 years old, and the event was this lavish entertainment put on for her by Edward Seymour, and it spanned over four days. On the fourth day of the entertainment, Elizabeth was met by a fairy queen attended by a train of dancers. The fairy queen planted a staff in the ground and placed on it a garland in the form of a crown, and she gave a speech saluting Elizabeth with the garland given to her by, quote, by Oberon the fairy king. The queen and her maids danced and sang a song, and Elizabeth was so delighted with this that she had the performers sing and dance it three times. Popular legend has it that Shakespeare was a part of this performance for the queen, and even that A Midsummer Night's Dream might have been first performed for this festival, but there's nothing to substantiate that. While I don't think um, Titiana can be called a fairy queen like the one from this production of A Midsummer Night's Dream, there are certainly many, many times in the play that scholars feel Shakespeare is alluding to Elizabeth I very directly. And as far as it being a stab at Robert Dudley, I haven't researched that myself. So for the sake of conversation, I'm going to agree with David Bevington, who writes on this debate, and he chooses to reject the idea that it was a critical political allegory on the grounds that Elizabeth would have been shrewd enough to see through that. And since the play wasn't offensive to her, but instead well received by her, it's unlikely that the play was intended as an insult. Sometimes I feel like they're always trying to find ways to connect Robert and Queen Elizabeth together and make it scandalous. Well, so romantic. It's hard to not, you know, so. Exactly. So the next listener question is actually a two part question. Okay. Is it true that the Earl of Essex and his men paid Shakespeare's company to play Richard II with the abdication scene included as a way to get the support of the people and as an attack on the queen? And, yes. And yeah. then how was Shakespeare and his men managed, to, how did they manage to escape the queen's wrath? Okay. Yes, absolutely. It is true. Um, Richard II was a popular street play at the time. It was performed a lot and dozens of times in England. Elizabeth knew this play very well, and she even famously said that she was Richard II. It was a deeply culturally embedded uh, piece of artwork, and Essex used it politically as a weapon against Elizabeth I. He was seeking to replace her and overthrow her and change out the the visors and, and everything. And normally, Richard II was staged with the abdication scene omitted to avoid specifically some of the political stabbing directly at Elizabeth that we alluded to with Midsummer, And that backs up Bevington's arguments about whether or not Midsummer was political. But this time, Essex had Richard II specifically requested to be performed with the abdication scene included on purpose. And official records show he paid Shakespeare's company at least twice what was typical for the performance. Now, unfortunately, he was overconfident in the people's rallying because he performed the play the the night before he marched into London, and then he marched marched in complete without any of the support, despite the play, and was promptly and easily arrested. Now, Shakespeare did not get into any trouble at all that we know of, and it is truly remarkable. By all accounts, he should have. In the aftermath of this event, after Essex was arrested, since the play did not rally his support as as it was intended, Essex ends up in court. And we have record that Shakespeare's company sent a representative 
of the playing company to court to state formally that, oh, we're merely players. We were just doing a job. We were paid to perform the play. And they basically make their excuses that they should not be held liable against the queen for doing their duty. And either she bought this excuse and that man should get an Oscar for his performance, or Elizabeth simply had bigger fish to fry. But Shakespeare quite narrowly escaped being tried for treason, as contemporaries of Shakespeare had been tried and imprisoned for substantially less. I do have a blog as well as a video that goes into greater detail on this topic if you're interested. And I would recommend um, episode 22 of that Shakespeare Life. We talked with Claire Asquith, who wrote a book and did extensive research into Shakespeare and the Essex Rebellion. And so while we don't know for sure what Elizabeth's motivations were for not prosecuting William Shakespeare, we do know that he quite narrowly escaped with his life and his playing company in that event. And Elizabeth had the last say because on the night before Essex was executed, Elizabeth ordered Shakespeare to perform Richard II again. And we don't know if she included the abdication scene. That's awesome. I've never heard that before. <laughs> now, the next um, listener question is kind of a what if question, which is always a fun one to answer. Uh, if the Tudor succession had been different, let's pretend Edward VI lived, married, had children, and or Mary had children, do you think that Shakespeare would have had the same success he did in the Elizabethan era? No, I don't. Um, I think Shakespeare came to London inside what was basically a perfect storm ripe for his arrival. I think the Renaissance combined with Elizabeth's focus on the arts and promoting culture was just the absolute right time for Shakespeare to be there. He was talented and skilled on his own, but he was also a product of his environment. And I think what he had to offer would not have been the same under someone else. Change one thing, right? And it doesn't, you know, it can change history. Yes. Well, I think that's, you know, you can see a huge shift in Shakespeare's plays and his reception in England just between Elizabethan England and Jacoby in England. So I think that's that's evidence, too, that, no, if it had been a different person, it would have been a different time. Now, lastly, we have the big question. What was Shakespeare's average yearly output of plays? Well, I should admit that I don't I don't know. <laughs> um, I want to research this further, but I did go and do a little bit of research to try and give the very kind listener who submitted this question a decent answer. So I will say he lived 52 years in total and he arrived in London when he was about 28, depending on how you date things. And he wrote approximately 37 plays that we know of at the moment. So that would make for a little over one a year on average that we have copies of. And since we know from our study of early modern theater that places like the Globe would have staged a different play every afternoon, it's possible Shakespeare wrote more or that the Globe, and, and we know that the Globe wasn't performing just Shakespeare plays. So since Shakespeare was an actor as well as a writer, it makes sense to me that he was active in writing and busy all of the time. And he would have written plays at the request of his patron. So I'm going to say one a year on average, and I want to explore this further. That's quite prolific, isn't it? I think so. I don't think I could turn out a play a year. So Yeah, it's insane. Amazing. Well, Cassidy, can you please tell everyone where they can find you, your podcast, and your website? Yes, please come join me every week on That Shakespeare Life. Episodes air Monday mornings and are available streaming on your favorite podcast directory. From breakfast to poopy shorts, we ask interesting questions about the life of William Shakespeare and get real answers from the experts who know him best. Learn more and dive into the 16th century when you visit me at CassidyCash.com. Cassidy, thank you so much for being on the show today and teaching us more about Shakespeare. This has been delightful. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks for checking out the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Read more. Read more on the blog at TudorsDynasty.com. Follow Tudor's Dynasty on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Subscribe to Tudor's Dynasty on iTunes. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much for hanging out until the after show. I wanted to take a quick minute to thank all of my patrons on Patreon, including two new patrons, Kelly R. and Clementine G. You guys, without your support, the show could not go on. If you'd like to become a patron, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash tutors dynasty and click become a patron. For as little as a dollar per month, you can show your support.